May that one protect us both, may that one nourish us both. May we work together with great energy and vigor. May our study be illumined. May we not unnecessarily gavel with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Last night I gave a talk to a group and the theme was on empathy. It was in response to somebody's question. And the question was how, more or less, how does empathy relate to spiritual life? And I thought it's such an important subject that I thought I would replicate many of the points that were made. But as with all my talks, I have no idea what I said. So I have to think afresh. See, the point is, there's a great danger in philosophy and its study. Even though we teach Vedanta, what is the danger? The danger is that although we try to make it spicy, that is, make it interesting, and try to address through question and answer mainly sessions, issues which are of real concern to people who are trying their very best to lead a noble and good life, and indeed more than that, a spiritual life with spiritual discipline at its core, following the directions of scripture and teacher. So often, it makes us more confined to the head when we talk about the principles, say, of Vedanta, and less about the heart. And yet, without the heart, we have nothing. We have no practice. If you have a contest between the head and the heart, the heart should always win. If it is to do with the intellect, or if it is to do with love, Love is a much more supreme value. In fact, the intellect can mislead us, filling the mind with too much, too much information, too many facts and figures, trying to retain principles. It takes us away from the practice. So what we should, we should be doing is, we should be opening the heart as if it were a flower, bearing in mind that a flower is generous by its own nature. Whether it's conscious or not, is designed as it were in such a way that it lends its fragrance to everyone. It uh, only requires a little bit of tender care. Nature normally provides it in the form of some rainfall. The nutrients in the soil are there. And all the creatures that live within the soil contribute toward the growth chemicals of nitrogen and so on. And the flower has this inbuilt knowledge to draw up nutrients from the soil, water from the soil. That's on the one side. On the other side, it has the wisdom to accept the photons or rays from the sun and convert it through its leaves into what it is. And its origin is just a small, almost unnoticeable, tiny, tiny microscopic seed. And from that seed has all the potential. In fact, studying the flower is a lesson to all of us. But you see, the beauty is not to be found in a book. The beauty is to be found in the eye. The eye that sees it. The eye that appreciates it. And we have an inbuilt aesthetic sense which understands what beauty is. And it gives us an internal feeling a corresponding resonance of beauty within us. Now, empathy is very different from sympathy. In the English language, we have these two words. And sympathy really 
is uh, something along these lines. Suppose saying a friend of yours dies and you're consoling the family. A person might say, I'm sorry, but it might be a word that hides the awkwardness one feels because we don't really understand what the person is feeling and we normally want to get away from the person who is suffering. And we can really only fully appreciate someone's suffering if we ourselves are suffering. And I can assure you, and you know it yourself, everyone has experienced suffering on different levels in different ways. Physically, we, are, we have been suffering. I mentioned that a baby being born is obviously not pleased about it, comes out crying. Of course, there's a physiological reason about, about bringing in the air into the lungs for the first time. And there's the severing of the connection through the umbilicus. The umbilical cord is cut. And then an individual life starts independently. But you say you're taking the child away or the infant, that is the fetus away from its warm growth incubator. It was incubated, nice and warm, vague sounds. It was learning things. And the physical contribution it had was from the nourishment from the bloodstream of the mother. And we are pretty sure that what the mother thinks the baby will shape the baby's character also. We can put this under the classification of nurture. But inherent is a nature. And if you take this transmigration uh, understanding as seriously as we do, then the child comes with an inbuilt set of characteristics that act as a base. And then from there on, the child is learning new experiences from the nurturing environment, building on the, uh, the experience that the child has because we are all destined for an unfolding situation that brings us into contact and then one with a supreme principle. All being on a journey, what a wonderful miracle, not just for one child, but for every person listening to this, whether it is live or whether it is broadcast and people view it on the media channels that, it, that this reaches. But you see, sympathy really is not the same as the intimate connection of empathy. Empathy means that I'm communicating with you in such a way that I appreciate all communication is a conveyance of this is how I'm feeling. It is not an information transfer, generally speaking, although it can be, but real, real communication is person to person, feeling to feeling. This is how I'm feeling, and I'm trying to transmute this into words. And so, in order to develop empathy, we really have to enter into the person's field, become one, as it were, with the person. And so we have this phrase, wearing somebody's moccasins. Now, moccasins are a kind of thin shoe. I mentioned this last night. The Native American Indians will wear it traditionally. They're made from some hide of some kind. But it is not, it is so, th so thin that thorns won't pass through it. And yet it is so resilient and tough that uh, it won't allow, sorry, it won't allow the thorns through. But by the same token, you will feel every ridge, every pebble underneath. That's a convenience thing because it's a kind of free reflexology. You get a massage on the foot. Most people in Africa don't wear shoes. Their feet are very tough. They, even they can, their foot can you know, step on thorns without any damage. But you see, wearing some of these moccasins is one thing then traveling several kilometers in these moccasins, then you really understand the person. Now, I also joked a little bit, there's a real story. Somebody was generous enough 
to get me a pair of moccasins from the United States of America. He said, this is handcrafted there. And I thought you would want to experience this kind of shoe. And uh, I thought, how wonderful, wonderful. And then I investigated on the bottom, said made in China. So, but still the thought of generosity of spirit was there. The sentiment was there. The sentiment of giving and trying to understand perhaps these would be good for a friend's feet. So empathy, more than anything else, requires us to feel what the other person feels. And we can only really do this by listening and responding on a feeling level. Now we are very poor listeners. This is something I pointed out. Because more than likely when somebody is talking, we are not really listening. Listening requires two things. It requires observation and it requires empathy. It requires trying to gauge and trying to stand where the other person is standing emotionally. And we can only do that really through patience, observe, an, an observing kind of listening that has within it no sense of interruption or formulating a conversation while the other person is talking or having any kind of disruption or deviation or distraction in the mind while the other person is talking. And it's not exactly what a person is saying. It's a whole combination which we miss on the media because we haven't got the advantage, full advantage of body language. And most of what we are conveying has to be a combination of words, facial expressions, tone of voice, and body posture. And when all this is observed and combined, then we're able to assess properly what is the person feeling. So I'm just going to mute. So listening is really an art, but if we haven't got the empathy to listen in the first place, then listening is not going to be very efficient. One thing that we tend to do is we tend to make some comments in the middle of the listening process, which means we're not listening at all and completing another person's sentence. I was at the airport and I met your cousin. No, 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 no. I met an old friend from two years back. And then, of course, uh, we tried to get some things in the supermarket. And there, oh, you met another friend. No, 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 no. I saw something I needed and I bought. And then you went home in a car. No, we took a bus. You see, when you complete somebody else's sentences, then this is not listening. In fact, this is asserting your own egoistic position. So empathy requires a declutching of a sense of I that is intrinsically selfish, as intrinsically I oriented, and therefore not in the category of what we call sattva. What do we mean by sattva? The purity of thought and word and deed and action that has no sense of individuality or self-interest contained within it. Most of our actions, most of our thoughts will be egocentrically orientated with my concern first. What do we mean by renouncing our egocentricity? We say, if I have food, let me not eat first. You eat first. You eat and whatever is left over, if anything at all, you can give me back. That's not really the strategy most people use. The approach they have is, look, I'll eat first and whatever's left over, I can give to you. And this they call charity is nothing charitable about it. And so people who are skeptics will say, well, we haven't come across any real altruism. People do some charitable work or some seemingly social service but always there's a satisfaction. I feel good when I do some good to another. That aspect of it is not sattvic. 
Now, sattvic has nothing to do with traditional concept of morality, what is right, what is not right. No, it is to do with purity because when the mind gets saturated predominantly with purity, where we are extracted from the fundamental urges of survival and of uh, struggle and uh, uh, the same kind of approach to existence as every other biological species has. What puts us in a more viable position where we are able to free ourselves from what we call samsara, a kind of constant engagement on a constant wheel, we can't get off it easily. We don't know how to, and we want to. But you see, the obvious thing is get off. If you're on a Ferris wheel and you pay money to go round and you enjoy going round so much that when it stops and the man says, now you please get out, you just sit there and you cannot get out. You don't wish to get out. Well, you do in a sense, you wish to be free from it, but you sit there and go round and go round and go round and each round also can be another life. What is the benefit of sattva that all these noble attributes would have the effect of reducing and eliminating pain? Because every egocentric position will give you pain. Maybe not in the immediate term, but at some point in time, either immediate or later, down the track. And so we have a great motive, even though the motive itself is selfish, still that yields ultimately to a kind of purity of thinking where we are no longer concerned with ourselves, more concerned with the other. Such people exist and have existed and we can use this as an example of the fact that this evolutionary formula of struggle and survival of the fittest does not apply to the advanced human who is free from all of those constraints. So empathy is, in, is not only important in spiritual life, that is stirring genuine feeling, the highest level of compassion, and without this empathy, we cannot have compassion. It's not really important, but it's absolutely vital. We cannot do without it in spiritual life. Then, of course, people may say, well, the whole of humanity, let's say 8 billion people, seem to be suffering largely, either physically or emotionally, psychologically. Is it possible to have empathy for everyone? And of course, it's possible to have general empathy but real specific one-on-one -on -one empathy is only within our small circle. But still within our spiritual life, we should have those moments of expansion of the heart. Now, Buddhism have a very interesting, very wonderful practice. That is, uh, they call it metta, metta meditation, where they expand their sense of compassion more and more and more for everyone. And of course, all these techniques involve a form of visualization, mobilizing one's creative imagination so that the feeling intensifies. Now, feeling, imagination, sense is all, these are all associates of genuine opening of the heart or empathy. And so we sometimes have to imagine based on experience, what people will be going through. And yes, if we haven't been through the same kind of circumstances, it's very difficult for us to stand in the other person's shoes. Now, if we apply that to every kind of communication, there will be no quarrels. And we're not looking for intellectual agreement. That we can bypass. We're looking for a contact, the contact with the other person with such an empathy, such an understanding that we truly, truly mobilize our highest impulses, our highest responses. Charity then begins there. It is not there as a principle, 
is there because we are mobilized, we are forced by virtue of our very fe feeling to do some service. And in spiritual life, we go further beyond compassion where everyone is suffering. People are all suffering, have suffered physically in the past. Some are suffering now as we speak. Some of you may be suffering physically, but there's no question we will all suffer in the future. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, this is the rent we pay for the body. So suffering is really intrinsic. It's built into the body and it's built in in our favor. Because if you do not have a neurological uh, response that comes to the skin, well, then you won't know whether the skin has been harmed or not. And the repair mechanism responds straight away to pain. And pain occurs in the neurology of the brain. And the brain response gives a signal. Something is not right. It needs to be attended to. So there is a utility to pain. It's in our favor. But is it pleasant? No. Can we get away from it? Yes, we can. We can, through pure concentration, withdraw the mind because normally our consciousness is spread outward through all the apertures of the senses to the objects. It is the objects that produce the pain for us. Well, systematically, we can, step by step, learn to withdraw our awareness, our sense of attention from the outside, and go on toward the inside. This we find in the Katu Panishad there. One wise man decided that they will come away from the outside and start going into the inside. And they're residing their own nature, consciousness itself, where they stand poised and immune to anything. But not everybody knows the secret. Very few know this secret. And so with a penetrating vision, we can see in the psychic area, the area of the mental field, more or less everybody is suffering. They're suffering from perhaps self-doubt. Sometimes they may be suffering from criticism from others or a self-conscious feeling, what will they think of me? Or how can I live up to the expectations of others? This is why we study, for example, the Enneagram in order to understand what these individual vulnerable points are for ourselves and others and how we can overcome them. But that doesn't mitigate against the fact that people are suffering. And we know what that suffering looks like on a different levels. You see, who can ever understand the suffering of somebody who suddenly lost a home, family, nowhere to go, refugee, spurned by communities, seem to be a nuisance by some and so on. There are, I don't know what the statistics are, but probably more refugees in this period of time in modern life than there has ever been in the history of mankind. People who are wandering homeless, people whose local situation through either warfare or caused by greed or power, are entirely homeless. And I think I mentioned before, not so long ago, we had United Nations Peace Day. One speaker in Italy said, in answer to the question, um, so who are the peacemakers? He said, we are all the peacemakers. We are all the peacemakers. And I had to make a comment. I said, actually, nobody really wants the peace. We hold it as a theoretical value. Yes, we should all be peaceful, but generally what we mean is, please leave me alone. Don't disturb my peace. Because if we truly wanted peace, there would be no domestic violence. There'd be no wars. There'd be no cruelty man to man. We have inbuilt in us somehow an arrangement whereby we justify circumstances so we are remote from another person's feelings and deal with them impersonally. And that generates cruelty. There's no genuine love. It is not a truthful position. 
Because if we now have a penetrating vision beyond the field of the mind, there we find everything is completely full and free. And there, there's nothing to change. There's nothing to feel sorry for. But the highest possible sentiment is reached because there we see the divine Lord of the universe dressed up with full and free and perfect. Nothing to add, nothing to take away. And there our compassion yields to adoration. And everywhere we look, we can mobilize our aesthetic sense to mobilize our inner feeling of adoration, wonder, thankfulness. We can add joy at the abundance all around us. All the resources that are provided unasked, making sure that we understand that the being that we call God is lovable. God is love, declares most religions who have a God. Buddhism doesn't have it, but they have compassion. So where, why do we love God? Why are we encouraged as devotees to love God? It's because there has to be a realization that there is a source provided free of charge that always flows toward us for our benefit. And that means, therefore, that that free giver, the grace that is always flowing, that free giver must be a dispenser of continuous love. Something like a mother's love also. Something comparable to unconditional love. Something that is always flowing. He never stops, no holiday for it. And doesn't even demand thanks or adoration. Leaves it up to our own device, our own willpower, our own response. But the response itself is a delight and stimulates a sense of joy. Without this feeling for our fellow person, there cannot be any true service. There's no meaning to social work, philanthropic work, or any of these things without this deep, deep sense of empathy that generates and stimulates compassion. And it is this compassion that has this transforming effect in the world. Even if a holy person sits in a cave, remote from the whole of society, the holy thoughts generated have the capacity to transform the whole world. Such people are doing the highest good, even though nobody knows it. Nobody sings their praises, remaining secretly in, in a isolation, absorbed in prayer, meditation, and the spirit of spontaneous generosity, not asking for anything for themselves, but rather simply having a concern for not just humanity, but all living beings, all living creatures. How can we know suffering if we haven't suffered? How can we know to console bereaved people if we ourselves have not been through the bereavement process? And those who haven't can at least try to find out what is what does it feel like? You see a grieving person losing a loved one, let us say. Well, but the dying person is losing everything. They're losing their house. They're losing their bank account. They're losing their pets. They're losing all their relatives and friends. They're losing their clothing. They're losing everything. But you see, at a certain given moment, that person surrenders very contentedly, just as we surrender to sleep. So why are we grieving? We're only grieving for ourselves. That doesn't mean to say that we should not grieve and understand the grieving person. Bhagavad Gita tells us the wise, they grieve neither for the living nor the dead. And this sounds very callous. But then when somebody challenges it, our response is yes, but we're not wise. It's only the wise that have that level of discernment. And even that doesn't mean to say they're detached working for the good of all beings, sarva, sarva muta, all beings, 
this is the characteristic of somebody of steady wisdom, says the Bhagavad Gita. Stita Pratnya, steady wisdom. What does that what does that entail? How does a person walk? How do they live? How do they stand? What do, how, how do they speak? How do we know? The question earlier on this morning, how do we know when a person is free or holy? And the, the it shines, you cannot hide it. The face shines like a thousand suns. And the behavior is completely different from the so-called normal average human being because they're devoid of self, selfishness and self-consciousness. They have no idea of their own benefit for themselves. It's all orientated toward the benefit of others, continuously like that. So we should engender this sense of empathy more and more and more and make it genuine by trying to put ourselves exactly in the position of the other. We do it anyway. We have this sympathetic resonating system when we watch a film. Somebody weeps in the film, we also weep. Somebody laughs in the film, we also laugh. And empathy is not just about pain and sorrow. Empathy is also about sharing joy because emotions vary, they range, not just from pain and sorrow, but empathy is also there in terms of sharing a joy. But inevitably, when somebody has a success, we feel jealous or something of that nature. And that makes us unhappy. In the Patanjali Yoga Sutras it gives us a whole array of responses that are helpful to us in expanding the spirit of generosity and freedom. Be friendly to all. Don't criticize anybody. The Holy Mother, Sharada Devi, says, if you want to find peace of mind, don't find fault with others. Rather, find your own faults because nobody is immune for, from it. Jesus says, you see, he who is without blemish, cast the first stone. And so nobody cast the first stone because they realize, oh, all of us are in the same boat. None are perfect. And yet we're exhausted, exalted, and exalted. Be you perfect as your Father in heaven. This is all the ideal. And some people interpret this as, well, it's just Jesus was saying this applied to himself, but it's unrealistic. Perfection is unrealistic. No. What Jesus meant is, you're already that. You have to reveal it. So to understand, to read another person, is that is the only way we can really, truly relate to the person as a person with the maximum amount of concern the maximum amount of tuning in to the other person's needs. That includes sharing joyful moments, sharing the pleasance, be friendly to all, says Patanjali. And then be happy, be joyful for those who are successful and be compassionate to those who are suffering, who are not so successful and be indifferent to matters of good and bad, virtue and vice. It's not your business. What is your business? Your business is to access that perfection inside everyone. And so all of these qualities of expanding the heart, and that is why you see the maximum expansion of the heart dedicated toward a supreme principle brought into our area as an intimate friend or intimate relation, intimate meaning so close to me, closer than my most beloved friends and family, or closer than my possessions. Bringing that in and diverting your attention away from the things, the small things that you love, replacing it with a grand love of that one being that can only be lovable because there's no other being that loves us so much, where love flows to us in ways that we take for granted. We take for granted all the resources around us, air and sunshine, the mechanism of breathing, 
the complexity of the human body and how it's coordinated, we simply are not aware of any of this. We live our life in complete oblivion to all these details. An anonymous donor supporting us continuously a non-demanding love. And the minute we cultivate and practice non-demanding love called Bhakti Yoga, then two things happen. There's a whole transformation in our inner psyche. We become happy, we become content. We become, we lift ourselves up from depression and unhappiness. We put ourselves in another realm. And the other benefit, uh, and along with that, I should say, that that forms an opening, an opening uh, window, if you will, in the soul. And the more open, the more we discover. The more we discover, the more we get the happiness. That's the first benefit. But the second transformation is the environment itself. Thought produces all of the environment around us that responds to it. New opportunities come. If we consider the whole universe as a playground of abundance, abundance comes to us, it flows to us. When we let go, then divine grace flows in. The wind of God's grace is continuously blowing. We have but to set our sails, says Ram Krishna. Learning to let go open and respond generously with the maximum generosity is all in response to this one question of empathy, a vital, vital, necessary relationship that we have to cultivate. So we have to learn in summary just to listen more closely, listen with a great deal of understanding putting ourselves exactly in the position where the other person is. That means being devoid of criticism. That leads to a loving attitude that is all embracing and has no place for not even a thought of criticism. That kind of spirit, cultivating it, radiating it, is a transformer transforming not only yourselves, but transforming others. And transforming, transformational causation, we are masters at. We know how to take raw materials. We know how to convert them into something useful. If you have a good artistic eye, you'll take all the scrap metal of the world and convert it into a work of art. In Dungannon, in the visitor center, there's a small museum there. There's some beautiful artist who's taken throwaway iron, spades, shovels, pieces of springs, and welded them all together and made a cow, the, the sculpture of a cow. We are resourceful in this way. We have always been resourceful. It's the one characteristic of the product of human evolution is that we are geniuses. Even those people naked living in forest areas or in the backwaters, let's say, of Africa. In West Africa, there is a certain tree with a root that contains a toxic substance. Local people know how to extract this and they insert it into the water and this stuns the fish and they're able to catch it catch the fish. Where does such ingenuity and discovery come from? We cannot relegate it to primitive thinking. This is sophisticated thinking. How to survive in an area where there's no electricity, there are no resources that we rely on and take for granted in a developed world. And yet there's a level of happiness, contentment, ingenuity, creativity, fun, laughter, social interaction. There's a, a documentary about people in blue zones, they call it, who live to be over a hundred years. 
And of course, you know my old joke about the person who said, you know, who lived over a hundred years, what's the secret of your life? Well, diet and good living and uh, do some exercise and so on. But above all, above everything else, I owe my longevity to canceling my passage on the Titanic. But you see, the discovery in these blue zones examine all kinds of things, examine the physiology of people, their level of activity, they do no systematic exercise, all their exercise is in gardening or walking, but they live in a rural kind of existence. They live amongst people, they live in a social environment, they are supported, they have hobbies and interests that keep their minds active. No cases of dementia ever. And so there's some kind of formula that enhances their longevity. And it boils down to one thing. They are peaceful, happy, contented people. They have an element of bubbling joy within them. It is only people who think they have struggles, think they have difficulties, and are so engrossed in their own concerns that they cannot, in those circumstances, have any understanding that leads to a compassionate attitude toward others. Look at the worldwide movement that could happen if everybody had this wonderful, deep quality, all penetrating quality of compassion for all, regardless, devoid of any criticism, devoid of any need to improve others. Simply smile and radiate your own sense of light and life and love. Well, with that, I'm going to make this talk a little short. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Thank you. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swami. Thank you, Swami. Thank you, Swami. Thank you, Swami. Oh.